Today, I want to share with you my opinion about the new Canon R5C. But you may ask, the camera isn't available yet, so how can I comment on it? The case is that my friend, who is a Canon fan, he was already very excited about the R5 and he always want to have an all-around camera. But the R5 will overheat when shooting 8K movie. So now he is really looking forward to this R5C. Since the R5C has overcome the heat problem in shooting 8K movie. And he thinks that maybe in 4 to 6 or even 10 years times, there's no need to change camera. It seems a very good investment. So he asked me for an opinion. Okay. On the other hand, the R5C basically evolved from the R5. The spec mostly remained the same. The main change is the R5C is more video oriented. So theoretically, the performance of the R5C can be judged based on the R5, and it can be verified later once I get a hands on. Will there be any change of my opinion? Now, it seems there is a practice from those camera manufacturers that they will first launch a flagship hybrid camera for stills photos and then slightly modify to make it a video oriented hybrid. We've already seen this with the Panasonic S1. First the S1 and then the S1H. Just like the Canon now, R5C is a member of the EOS C series after the R5. The R5C is quite similar to the S1H bigger and fatter. And there is also the shark fin type air outlet, an active cooling system with a fan for air intake. And finally, it solved the overheating problem of shooting 8K movie for a long run. Please be remember, it can shoot 8K raw internally. Now, let's have a brief look over its spec. As said before, the R5C is just so similar to the R5. A 45 megapixel sensor with 8K horizontal resolution. The other accessories are pretty much the same, similar display and will find it, or even the battery. But to enhance the performance of video shooting, it does introduce certain new features. One of them is the Canon RAW light. There are three resolutions, the LT, ST and HQ. Only the LT and ST can take full frame 8K resolution movie, while the HK can only handle the cropped Super 35 resolution. And this sensor, apart from the full frame, provide two more crop mode that include Super 35 and Super 16. Of course, you can shoot 4K and Full HD 2K videos with it. Oversampling image and method will be applied for shooting 4K or Full HD video. And so you can take photos with it, and the performance again is similar to the R5. I always emphasize that for me, I will always use the highest performance with the camera I bought. A camera is not for show off. Unlike a Ferrari, you can show off with a Ferrari. For its superior performance like just 2 seconds in 0 to 100 km or a top speed of 300 km, even you can't fully play it on the street, the car itself is still very eye catching. But not the case with camera. So I don't recommend using the R5 seaters for 4K or Full HD video filming. Though, of course, you can do that. In my opinion, there are other better and cheaper options for filming 4K or Full HD videos. Maybe you can use a lower level camera. For example, the 5D Mark IV, the performance is still very good. But for the R5C, I will stick with 8K RAW. The R5C also has another nice feature. Simultaneous deal recording of a proxy file and raw file. So in post-production, even with the 8K movie, there's no need to make another proxy file from the original. You can just replace the extension of the file name later for output or color correction. No need to spend a lot of effort in preparing for post-production. And in fact, I think every professional movie camera should offer this feature. Now, let's see what other cameras currently offer 8K resolution recording. Of course, this Canon R5. And also, there's the Nikon Z9, the Sony Alpha 1. Traditional camera brands are mainly the above three. 
In my opinion, the Nikon Z9 is quite expensive, about US dollar 5,500, and it is a still photo-oriented camera. Video is in return only an additional function. Therefore, compared to the R5C, Z9 has a different positioning. And regarding the Sony R1, actually, this is a very remarkable camera, though internally it can take 4K video only. It can shoot raw movies, but you have to use an external recorder. It inevitably increases the cost. Plus, it's not so convenient compared to record internally. In addition to that, there is the Zcam E2 F8, a box tech camera and mainly focus on raw video shooting. Again, it has to use an external recorder. And the final one would be the Blackmagic Ursa. However, it's not 8K and instead, it's a 12K video camera. It's not cheap either, and the form factor is quite large compared to a mirrorless camera. Thus, I think the positioning of the R5C is quite unique and independent. This is because internally capable of 8K raw movie recording machine is rare on the market. Regarding the flaws, I think there are two half plus one. The first of the half flaw is the optical anti-vibration system was taken away. I mean the IBIS. Yes, the 5S's IBIS was taken away and replaced by an EIS, electronic in-body stabilization. Honestly speaking, I never use those EIS. I will say that when the EIS add up with the IBIS, the result is really good. But the effect is not so good just with the EIS only. Plus, there will be a 1.1 times crop when the EIS is applied. Of course, it has to crop from the native resolution to perform the EIS. And as said before, if you use the EIS, then you are just filming with MPEG. A bit wasteful with this camera. To put it in another way, if it gets optical stabilized, then it is us. Consider using it or not. Since optical stabilizer engages with the sensor and then no longer crops, and thus we can shoot raw with that. But they can't solve the heat problem, and thus the IBIS has to be removed. And the second half problem is when it utilizes the highest bed of video shooting, the lens native electronic functions are no longer supported. For example, the autofocus or the EIS. Actually, it can be overcome by applying an external battery. Not an ideal solution, since it will affect a bit of the compass. But again, this flaw doesn't really matter to me, since I mostly shoot movie with manual lenses. For both focus and aperture, I still prefer manual lenses. Apart from the above two defects, there is another very crucial one. For this relatively big camera, it only gets a mini HDMI output. A bit disappointed. We all have the experience that HDMI is very inconvenient for shooting. A mini HDMI may be only suitable for an on top external monitor, but not good for a long HDMI cable since the cable can easily break. And worse yet, it damaged the motherboard with the mini HDMI port. Yes, it's the worst effect for me. And I will suggest that for a video oriented machine, at least a full size HDMI is needed. The best would be the SDI, or at least a mini SDI for conversion. When choosing a camera, I will also consider other factors besides resolution. Though, maybe you think with a very high res camera, you probably won't need to replace cameras for 4 to 6 years or even to 10 years. But can you really resist the allure of new camera? Technologies evolve so fast that you have no idea what will happen in just 2 years. There are other more attractive cameras often. Or that means you are really loving with 8K resolution. But regarding this R5C, I still get one doubt about 8K. That said, compared to other low resolution camera, the low light or high ISO performance inevitably gets weaker. The factory spec told that there is a dynamic range of 14 stops. But I always emphasize that 
don't hundred percent believe that. Why? In order to get a beautiful figure, those factories always include a stop, even with just minimal difference. But those differences are actually invisible to our lake eyes. It seems quite ideal, but indeed it's not visible in real life. Here, I found a lab test of the R5 Stunner range done by the Cinity.com. Though it was not the R5C, and as I said before, the R5C is evolved from the R5. It could be used as a reference. The result was 12 stops of dynamic range. I would say that it's expected, since most of the camera nowadays are making between 10 to 12 stops. And more importantly, how is the distribution of these 12 stops? There are 4 stops in the upper part, while the lower part gets more. What did it tell us? It means this R5 is a little less tolerant of highlight area. So you have to take care more to the highlight area to avoid overexposure. In theory, the optimal dynamic range is with the 18% grade sitting in the middle of the range. Right now, the performance of the R5 is quite similar to those M4 third, since M4 third always get a lesser dynamic range in the upper part. Furthermore, I've said before that latitude also matters. Dynamic range result will be affected with your aperture, and in order to get the best performance, you have to really lower the latitude. In the real world, you will never get an ideal scene that perfectly fits your camera's dynamic range. Your object will almost never be exactly 18% grey. That's why at a certain moment, we have to light up the scene. This is because we have to compensate for the dynamic range. And if you can't light up with artificial light, you have to compensate with the latitude to achieve the best dynamic range. For example, the contrast of the scene has out of the range of 12 stops, then you may try to use its latitude response to compensate. However, when I shot this review, I couldn't find any latitude test of the R5. So I tried to extrapolate it with those similar 8K resolution cameras. And you can see that the Lycan Z9 can achieve plus 3 and minus 3 stop respectively. The Sony A1 is a bit better with a total 8 stops of latitude. The 24 megapixel Lumix S1 and S1H are also better with a total of 8 stops. So I will deduce that the R5C will also get a latitude about 6 to 8 stops. Here we can look at the benchmark of industry. The Ari Alexa LF can reach plus 5 and minus 5 stops respectively. It proves why the Ari is so expensive, although it just gets the same 14 plus stop of the range. Its latitude is plus 5 and minus 5. So, no matter how high the resolution of the other cameras can be, Ari remains the only main camera for film production. As said before, the low light or high ISO performance of such high res camera would be compromised. Really? The spec told that the highest ISO would be 51,200. It can be extended to 102,400. My experience tells me that the usable ISO can be obtained by reducing the maximum ISO by 20%, or roughly minus 2 stops. Then the usable ISO would be 12,800. Other tests achieve similar results. It shows that the usable ISO is between 12,800 to 25,600. And again, this performance is so similar to the GH5S. How come to this comparison? The pixel size of 4K width on the M4 first sensor has the same ratio size of a full frame 8K. And so, the pixel size of the GH5S sensor is quite similar to those of the R5 or R5C. My experience was that the ISO 12800 of the GH5S is still quite good. A little bit of the noise has to be applied for ISO 25600. So, with similar pixel size, the low light or high ISO performance would be very similar. Certainly, not on a path with the A7S since the A7S only comes with 4K resolution on a full-frame sensor. The pixel size on the A7S would be much larger. 
The result is the low light and high ISO performance would be much better than those high res cameras. So, after all the analysis, would you like to order or even buy one at this moment? Or wait for more reviews first? I am looking forward to seeing if I will change my idea after hands on later. Maybe the performance of the real machine is much better than I thought.